before we start could anyone in the chat please let me know if you can hear me and uh, and see me well i will also open up a browser and just see uh take a look at myself if uh, if the video and all audio qualities are are fine and also could please anyone in the chat also let me know if you can hear me and see me well Yeah, I think I can see myself and hopefully someone will also confirm that uh, they're able to hear me and see me well. Um, welcome to an online chess class. Today we're going to be speaking about the most fundamental perhaps uh, part of chess. Uh, everyone who um, has their own first class with any of the chess coaches or if they go to any chess club, the first thing that anyone will teach them in strategy uh, is going to be about the center. So today's topic is going to be the center. Uh, I can see people are joining. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I assume that you can hear me and see me well. If you can, just confirm me in the chat. Um, before we go to the lesson, uh, perhaps I should again short shortly introduce myself. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Castoni, and uh, for the last eight years, I'm a full-time chess coach. And today I'm very happy to present to you uh, the first part of the fundamentals all right so everything is good and i think we can uh, then without further ado proceed with uh, with today's chess class so since we're going to speak about the center i'll have to explain you why do we need to control the center at all why do we need pawns in the center if we need them at all why do we need pieces in the center and i'm going to show you quite a few games that i i think that are going to boost your level quite a bit uh, it doesn't matter how high rated you are i believe that the games are going to be instructional for any kind of rating ranging from zero to up to 2000 and uh, i think that you all will uh, enjoy the games uh, as much as i did when i was preparing for this lesson so first of all why do we need the pieces in the center well the pieces in the center are the most active what does it mean well it usually means that they control the most of squares i set up this position it's not a position that we we're going to analyze a lot but if you notice maybe i can make the white pieces green and black pieces red when white pieces are in the center they control more squares if you look at any piece say compare the knight with the opponent's knight white's knight is controlling eight squares and uh, the black knight there in the corner is only controlling two and same for queens and bishops white pieces are controlling more squares and so that means that the pieces if they're safe in the center are the most effective there I think that there are quite a few other games besides chess where controlling the center is very important because that's the part from where you can easily uh, get access to any part of the board so now uh, since we know that the pieces are the most active and the most effective in the center uh, we may ask ourselves a question and that question is this why do we need the pawns in the center why don't we just develop the pieces to the center so can anyone in the chat uh, try to ans answer the question why do we need to get the pawns to the center for example why cannot we just develop the pieces immediately i know it's very basic but uh, let's start with the basics and then um, gradual will increase the level of of the questions and the examples So there are quite a few answers. Uh, someone is suggesting that we need to control um, the four squares. Um, others are saying that we may lose pieces early on. Um, there are also some others are saying that there are openings where we just control the center with uh, the pieces as well. Uh, so the classical way of looking at the center in general is that we need the pawns to support uh, our pieces. So 
that's the most classical and the oldest approach and there is this modern way of thinking about it that's one of the also person's opinion in the chat that we are able to control the center with the pieces and uh, sometimes we don't need the pawns uh, to be there for example there is a grandfold defense and there are such openings but before we understand that we have to understand the classics right and if we look at the difference between say moves e4 and e3 let's just say we play e3 that controls also uh, the center once just like e4 however this d4 square is, is not in the opponent's position if we can divide the board into two parts we can notice that uh, the e3 pawn is not controlling the fifth rank or above what does that mean for black well uh, let's just say black controls the center and now white tries to remember the opening principles and one of them saying that we need to control the center with the pieces and we need to develop now if we're going to play knight f3 our knight can be chased away so this pawn on e3 it doesn't shield our own pieces uh, from opponent's pawns same would happen if say we would uh, play something like bishop to c4 and so right now our opponent can play d5 and kick our bishop again so instead of developing the other pieces now we have to move the same bishop again and because white ha black has this huge control of the center right now he will comfortably develop the pieces to the best squares so that's the old way of looking at it and if we dive deeper that's one of the reasons why everyone used to like the moves d4 and e4 and they loved those uh, to the current day for white now if we play e4 uh, as you notice because the queen is on d1 we can get d4 break quite easily because it's already protected and so in a lot of openings let's just say we play e5 knight to f3 attacking the pawn on e5 and now we have knight to c6 we get this break very very early on that's not the only way of playing the game as you know there is a Rui Lopez and there is the Italian opening but that's one of the main lines in this opening that's called the scotch game and why they challenging the black center immediately if we count the number of pawns we have over there it's two versus one and say after takes and takes white has more center and ideally perhaps white should be able to get better bishops and knights because they will sh that pawn will give protection uh, for our pieces in the center where they're the most effective so that's the classical way of looking at that and so we can get this superior central control which sometimes could also extend to space advantage if we put the pawn on e5 in many many openings so say this is the scotch game we could also look at ones like the sicilian defense white again will play knight f3 knight to c6 d4 bam bam and so very fundamentally if we don't take anything else into consider consideration we could say white is controlling the center with the pawn and thus ideally maybe he should get better bishops and knights as the pawn will give us more protection from opponent's pawns whereas our pawn could possibly in the future maybe march e5 we take away d5 and f5 squares which potentially black would want to use for one of his pieces now many many years ago perhaps people didn't like d4 as much for this reason because after d5 the old king over here doesn't support the break e2 to e4 it's just hard to get it and so people tried playing it with knight to c3 and black was so stubborn they wanted to control the square and not allow white to get the move e4 and white usually try to play this with bishop g5 and try to still achieve the e4 break which would guarantee them more central control if say black plays something like h6 or e6 then the life is beautiful we could just take for example take and achieve that our dream break of e4 when white again could be saying that hey i have more pawns in the center so i will have an easier life of developing the the, the pieces to the center or at least that's how they thought it should be and later black tried to defend the, the the e4 square with the bishops and if white would just casually develop after a couple of moves what we would find ourselves in perhaps is the position where black puts the pawn on c5 and then white would be playing black would be able to place the pawn knight on c6 and already this combination of knight on c6 and the pawn on c5 uh, looks better than the knight on c3 and the pawn on c2 
So people stopped playing maybe uh, D4 like 150 years ago until one person discovered that we could also control the center with the move C4. So since we cannot get E4 very easily in this opening, people are just playing C4 and now we have two versus one pawns in the center. The first time black saw this, they were thinking, hmm, isn't that just a free pawn to take? Well, yes, but now white smiles, smile is from ear to ear, and white achieves their dream move E4. And so we're not only controlling the center, we're also attacking the pawn, and from the very, very fundamental perspective we will be able to control the center with the pawns and we are doing so so we will get an easier development of bishops and knights the most effective squares around the center so that's a the very oldest way of looking at the reason behind the pawns into the center so let's jump to the third study of ours i have to keep track of the numbers and let's see what happens if one side is completely neglecting the center Yes, yeah, someone was saying Queen's Gambit accepted. That is right. That was the name for the previous opening. So here, white is going to play e4. This was a real game. Black plays the Sicilian defense c5. Now, the next move of white is very interesting. White plays the move b4. Why would they play b4? Can anyone in the chat try to give a reasoning or the compensation that white is looking to get after black takes on b4? Why white would be playing this gambit? Of course, this is not the best way of playing. In fact, with a perfect play, black gets an advantage, but there still must be an idea behind this move. So why would white be gambiting upon? Can someone in the chat help me? Huh? So there are a couple of answers. Let's wait for a couple more people to join. Uh huh. Very interesting. So the chat is um, is saying everything perfectly. There are a couple of uh, opinions, but uh, I would just like to uh, say that all of you were correct. I think that from the the most important part that White is trying to achieve is undermine the Black's central control. Right now, if we look at the board as it is, uh, this pawn on d4 uh, on c5 is controlling the d4 square, and thus it is controlling the center, preventing White from placing his pawns and pieces on the center. And so we're offering them our pawn that is not controlling the center. So after c takes b4, we will be able to now or later in the game get an easy d4 which guarantees us the central control and we know already the benefits that come with it very effective pieces and someone else was also suggesting very right thing that we can develop now uh, perhaps the dark square bishop or the knight um, with the tempo after move a3 it's also true that uh, white perhaps could play bishop to b2 and develop a piece with the tempo but usually after this move uh c takes b4 what white is playing is offering another pawn and so this time if black takes the pawn we could take with either the knight or the bishop and start not only leading the central control but also the development and in this game black will neglect the center at all with the pawns so he's playing knight to c6 after this move white took the pawn on b4 and black played knight f6 so the question is is it the best way to control the center with the pieces this way? There are quite a few openings when we can control the center with the pieces and pawns are not enough. But that is not the case. Why? What, what white can do in this position? What is the problem for black? What would you guys play if you had the white pieces here? Don't worry if it's too easy. I promise you that I have prepared uh, quite a few very hard... Uh, classical games that even the most advanced players of you will enjoy i always like to start with the basics though mm -hmm. so there are suggestions b5 
And uh, you're absolutely right. What white can achieve in this position is chase away the black's knight. So because black has the control of the center and has an effective knights over there, white would love to kick them out as black didn't have any pawns that shield the knight from uh, white's pawns kicking them out. So b5, and now perhaps the black's knight only has a couple of squares that are good to choose from, but from both uh, squares he will be chased away, whether it's d4 or e5. Well, in this case, black played knight to d4, and now white plays c3 and kicks the knight out. So knight to e6. Now white plays e5, and look what is happening with the black pieces. White is gaining superior control over the center. White black has to just jump uh, again and again with the knight knight to d5 by the way this was a real game c4 again white is putting another pawn that is controlling the center this time in the opponent's camp with uh, a tempo knight d to f4 g3 knight to g6 f4 and now white is simply threatening f5 and uh, black seems to be actually losing a piece so black in the game took on f4 this was an old game by very famous players and uh, black soon had to resign not a good day for black so the first lesson is that if you try to put the pieces like that like specifically knights on the squares c6 and f6 be aware that they can be chased away by opponents pawns and that's one of the reasons why you need pawns in the center in the first place if you're so ambitious with your piece deployment now we can jump to a little bit more advanced um, study just a little bit more advanced and uh, i want to analyze this position without the bishops and the knights so imagine that we have d3 d5 e3 and e5 and i would like to ask the audience um, do you think um, that black is better in this position because of their central control seems like black is controlling the center so is black better i promise that there are no tactical tricks let's just poorly evaluate from strategic standpoint so the question is is black better in this position because of their central control? Probably there are going to be quite a few of opinions. You could also say that the position is equal. You might say that white is better. Um, or do you think that black is better or slightly better because of their central control? So, so there are quite a few opinions some people are saying that it is a draw some are saying that uh, black is better um, now the correct evaluation um, is probably that uh, the position is equal remember this that the pawns in the center as well as space advantage is usually generally means 90 okay 899 times out of 100 only benefits the minor pieces which is bishops and knights now do you think that these pieces of blacks benefit uh, from the pawns d5 e5 more than the white's pieces uh, from d3 and e3 and in fact it is not true uh, if we said in the previous examples that pawns in the center allows us an easier deployment of our pieces uh, where they're the most effective which, which means around the center and maintain them there then in this position it is not true because queen of white can always be active queen is moving in so many ways that the pawns are never going to restrict her in this position we could say play queen to g4 and attack the pawn if say the pawn moves or black castles we can play queen b4 and as you can see white's queen will always find squares to be active I would also like to say that the, uh, the rooks are not benefiting from uh, blacks or white central control in any way. So it turns out if bishops and knights 
are not on the board and here there is no difference to play a4 h4 d4 or e4 central control does not matter again in general maybe there is an exception to this rule but nine times out of ten and in this position as well here at least if we play a4 we could say that we're lifting the rook and rook could find activity via the third rack right so now you know that in every opening when the position seems to be cramped like for example let's just put a position of uh the, the French defense, for example, advanced variation. We know that every minor piece exchange should uh, benefit uh, black as long as, as they are changing quite a few pieces. So if we were to take, say, the uh, F1, G1, G8, and F8, okay, C8 uh, minor pieces off the board, black perhaps might be completely equal. Although in uh, this position with all four minor pieces we would be saying that white has superior central control or even you could say space advantage um, with the e5 pawn and the space advantage is something that you will learn in the next stream uh, from another coach as coach also very interesting topic uh, uh, you will see that is going to be very interesting as well so now once you understand already these things uh, we can slowly start looking at the games i still want to show you one more position uh, before we're going to look at full games where i'm going to give you full uh, uh, interesting ex exercises where i'm sure you will have uh, a lot of fun with those so i would like just to show you a couple of moves from the opening queen's gambit accepted and uh, white is going to play the e3 variation the idea with the e3 variation is that uh, white is easily and comfortably getting the pawn back on c4 and they're delaying e4 until they develop the pieces. So white is saying, for now, I just put the pawn on e3, I win back the c4 pawn, and then I will easily, um, say, get the e4 pawn, pawn to e4 when I will develop the, the other pieces that support it. Because, say, move e4 can run into e5 and not it's not everyone's cup of tea so we have e3 and our opponent let's just say plays knight f6 bishop takes c4 e6 knight f3 and we get a position where white has superior control over the center i would say white would want to play e4 and in this position if black was just to play passively for example let's make some passive moves bishop to e7 castle castle knight c3 knight bd7 for instance and e4 that just dead loss strategically for black white has huge strategic uh, advantage with the control of the center just immense control of the center that central control will, will then transpose into space advantage on the king side let's just say a couple more moves that are passive e5 central control leads to space advantage and now once we win in the center we can continue with king side attack for white so you could imagine bishop d3 queen d2 queen e4 those kind of threats or knight e4 knight g5 bishop is already looking there rook lifts deadly king side attack in practice so in order to avoid uh, all this scenario uh, black cannot allow himself himself to play passively and so what do you think would be the move for black uh, to fight for that central control and not allow white an easy game what should black be playing in this opening black for now seems to be lacking the central control and we would love to equalize in that as black and so yes you are absolutely right the chat is very active today black plus must play the, mon the pawn move c5 so what black is hoping for is to undermine the white center imagine that if c5 and d4 pawns are exchanged in theory the central control is rather equal perhaps you could say that white side leads the development and maybe bishop for now is controlling the center but that's a very so-called dynamical advantage just temporary and so in this position white usually castles and uh, black plays c takes d4 and here we're gonna transition ourselves uh, to another uh, understanding element uh, that we have to understand in chess so the question is this dear audience how should white take the pawn i can tell you that all three uh, ways of capturing the pawn are possible but if we open up the database of grandmasters 95 percent of masters are capturing one way here so you can guess 
what do grandmasters think or 95 percent of them what is the most precise way of capturing here to build up an advantage how should white capture on d4? And I'm very glad that uh, so many of you say the one thing. And I would proudly say that all of you are for now wrong. So only a couple of people said taking with the pawn. And if you set up this position in uh, the Grandmaster database, 95% are taking with the pawn here, which is shocking news. Let me explain you why, okay? So first of all, what happens if knight takes d4? It's true that white still has an advantage here and there is nothing bad about that move. In fact, that's a good move as well. But now you have a temporary advantage. You temporarily read the development. And if you will not be able to convert this temporary development into a, an initiative, then black is soon going to develop all of their pieces and you're going to find yourself in an equal position. So that is the problem. That if you won't be able to create threats in five or six moves, um, black can play moves like later, okay, bishop to d6, castle, knight c6, bishop d7, and the position will become equal. And so it's a lot harder to play with such a so-called dynamical advantage will, will, will just vanish very soon. And if you're not Magnus Carlsen, trust me, it's not going to be easy uh, to develop the initiative over here. So what is the reason of why People are taking with the pawn here. Well, take a look. If we take with the pawn, we're claiming the central control. We're controlling it more. You could also call this half a space maybe advantage. To me, maybe it's more of a central control, but we're controlling those squares in the opponent's position. Look at how many of white's pieces are benefiting from the capture with the pawn. So if we're taking with the pawn, the light square bishop has been opened. Bravo to the, I mean, dark square bishop. So here, if we take with the knight, it remains closed. And if we take with the pawn, it's opened. Let's take a look at the knight. Here, knight doesn't have any other outpost besides d4. If we take with the pawn, we have two outposts. Perhaps e5 is the most um, realistic one to get to. And it's deep in the opponent's position where knight is going to influence the squares around the black's camp so the knight is benef benefiting from that exchange as well now let's take at another piece take a look at the rook on e1 now rook can enjoy the open e file so black's rook cannot come to the e file or at least it doesn't control there are a lot of squares because uh, of course black's rook can come to e file but uh, look at the white's rook activity over the e file and the black's rook plus the black's light square bishop is closed in and you may say that the pawn is weak, but it's weak in the end game. In the middle game, uh, white will be able to develop and deploy their pieces to more efficient squares. Because black is lacking that central control and, and space even perhaps, black will find very hard to both blockade the pawn and also attack it. For instance, if you ever establish the knight on d5, then you're no longer attacking the d4 pawn. Now, if you somehow try to remaneuver the bishop in the middle game to the f6 square, you might sleep on d5 when d5 is going to exchange that isolated pawn. So the, the static advantage that taking with the pawn gives you is superior central control, which transitions to uh, more effective pieces or more effective deployment of the pieces, which will transi transition possibly to an initiative or a kingside attack. So d4 pawn is isolated because um, it's not um, protected or it cannot be guarded by any other pawns in the, the near future. So I would like to show you a couple of games how such an advantage of isolated pawn or just the pawn structure of the isolated pawn, I should say, could transition into uh, an initiative and a kingside attack. So this is the first game. We're going to take a look at... Uh, e4, c6, and Karakhan, and white plays d4, black plays d5, takes, takes, and we have the so-called panophoration of the 
um, of the Karo Khan. So whenever uh, black takes on c4 or uh, white takes on d5, the d4 pawn is going to be an isolated and we enter an isolated pawn structure. Of course, black doesn't want to usually take on c4 before the light square bishop is developed. So only after, say, we place bishop d3, black will take the pawn. And so then it counts that the light square bishop moved twice um, to capture on c4, which gets black at additional tempo. So we have a knight to f6 and knight to c3, e6, knight to f3, very common way of developing, bishop to e7. And here black takes on d5 and black takes with the knight, which gives white an isolated uh, d4 pawn, which is a, a good thing to have when you're leading the development in the middle game and a bad thing to have in the end game or when you're behind in development. So we have bishop to d3 this time, Perhaps if the bishop goes to d3, then white is more aimed at you know, potential kingside attacks. Whereas if we place the bishop onto c4 square, um, in the middle game, uh, black, white would be more looking to develop the initiative with this d4, d5 uh, pawn break. So we have castles, castles, rook, and knight to f6. Uh, at some point, black, white might be threatening. Um, to take on d5 and especially with rook e1 followed by bishop e4 so this would be just a prophylaxis move knight f6 going back and also the queen starts aiming at the pawn as well so we have rook to e1 knight to c6 and a3 now i would like to ask you uh why would white uh, be playing a3 in this position or this in this structure at all why would white be playing a3 strategically all the opinions are welcome there are no good moves or bad moves or good opinions or bad opinions just to, uh just the opinion so don't hesitate so just say what you think I would like to also ask the audience if it's possible um, to put a like on this video. This means that what I am making uh, is enjoyable for you and you're enjoying our, our lesson. Thank you so much for, uh, for those likes. So um, there are quite a few opinions and I have to say all of you are um, more or less right uh, about the control over the b4 square. However, it's not only to... Um, restrict the bishop, the dark square bishop. In fact, in this, these type of positions, what black is aiming for is to get knight b4, knight d5. It's not only to hit the bishop, it's actually to control the d5 square. And if black manages to block the d5, d4 pawn, then he can hope to somehow consider an attack against that. So if we just like randomly say, play a move like h3 and uh, black plays something like knight b4 with uh, bishop knight to d5 in theory to follow maybe this is not the most precise move order then that in general should be something that black finds good so for example without the correct move order bishop to b1 and knight to d5 and b6 bishop b7 to follow in general should give at some point black a comfortable game where black is controlling the blockading square d5 and then we can hope to not only maintain a good uh, piece in the center but also perhaps to put some pressure on d4 and plus we're taking away one of the main plants of whites which is to get rid of the isolated pawn with the break d5 not only get rid of it but a lot of the times also develop the initiative so that's a prophylactic move and usually if the bishop is on say c4 square then this um, a3 move would be a reaction to place the bishop on a2 because a lot of the times knight a5 could hurt us especially if we say play a, a move like d5 so um, quite a, an often move to be seen in the isolated pawn positions um, black played b6 now we have bishop to c2 white is preparing a, a nice battery with a possibility of uh, launching an attack against h7 so bishop g5 bishop f6 and a, pos uh, a, a classical mate on h7 could follow so bishop to b7 black always uh, or most of the time tries to establish control over d5 so the bishop on b7 makes a lot of sense we have queen d3 to follow and black without waiting plays g6 which uh, stops the 
yes so there are some questions in the chat don't hesitate guys um, to, to ask any kind of questions in the chat that's why I'm there with you use me as your uh, as your coach and the idea yes when you're playing versus isolated pawn is to stop it and uh, blockade it and then you have hopes of attacking it without the blockading of the isolated pawn nothing will work of you perhaps the only other plan that black has would be to enter an end game uh, but in these positions think about it it's really very very hard for black to be exchanging pieces without changing the structure many think that oh i come to uh, knight to d5 i take on c3 yay i exchange the minor piece but then you change the structure and so it's no no longer an isolated pawn and if it's no longer an isolated pawn the end game is no longer good for black same would happen after moves like knight e5 you take i take with my pawn and again the structure has been changed so here we have bishop h6 attacking f8 rook and you could already see the potential for white's uh, kingside attack with isolated pawn and this superior control of the center with the pawn in this case white can uh, build up uh, the pieces for the correct attack and he, we're taking our time it's not that we have an isolated pawn and we have to rush attack 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 immediately or else it will vanish no that central control uh is never gonna disappear unless black of course undermines it and uh black is uh, finding also hard to, to to attack the pawn and blockade it so we have rook to c8 and now uh, white thought that bishop has done enough already on this diagonal so we're switching the bishop to b3 watch this now even the a3 move suddenly is good so that we could place the bishop on a2 in case black plays knight a5 so what a multi-purpose move that was and now from this diagonal the bishop finally starts looking at the opponent's king again and we have potential danger okay i almost spoiled uh, what things are going to happen i don't want to say another purpose of the bishop there but yes we're aiming at at the king f7 and e6 and you will see what will follow very very soon so rook c7 um, black played one slow move and suddenly the game is over in 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 practice or and in theory so the thing is that in this position if say black uh, y just plays king h1 nothing bad will happen to white it's not like the white is like lost immediately but if black plays very slow move like say rook c7 or I, maybe i should amend myself and switch say in precise move black could just be lost immediately um, this rook c7 actually like makes sense from humans perspective we're over protecting the seventh rank like f7 maybe uh, the player thought to put the queen on eight with more massive uh, blockading uh, control over the blockading square and pressure along this diagonal maybe rooks uh, could double on the d5 for example with rook to d7 uh, but white plays knight g5 and from this superior central control now we have very very aggressive pieces which will transition to initiative so now black played bishop f8 and offers an exchange of minor piece getting closer to an end game he thinks well one piece exchange is not nothing bad to white i think that the most important always bishop uh, to keep is your good bishop which is the light square bishop the opposite color of the pawn in the center and white exchanges that uh, because what we get after that is a sacrifice so now i would like you guys to think of possible sacrifices in in this position and to for to develop a very very powerful initiative and perhaps uh, that will be the dagger and uh, white will win the game So there are quite a few suggestions there are um, rook e6 knight e6 and bishop takes e6 so i think that if we play uh knight e6 um after pawn takes e6 bishop e6 king h8 i feel like white definitely has a compensation maybe that's also a way to play uh, maybe we could say play a d5 uh, but black has a piece and here at least i don't know if white has enough it's very hard for me to judge at least my eyeballs are telling that perhaps it it could be not enough no bishop takes e6 followed by pawn takes e6 uh, is already 
much more interesting to me i feel like again after knight e6 maybe the game is just won we followed that up with something like knight f8 and we could very well win the game but what the grandmaster thought in this position and what he played was actually another move uh, maybe as good as bishop e6 maybe slightly better is rook takes e6 so keeping that powerful bishop because it will land some discover chest uh, if black was to take it so imagine f takes e6 knight takes e6 what is happening here 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 bishop is aiming at the king mamma mia right so after the queen moves say queen b8 we now take on c7 with a check and here white is just a winning positionally tactically we have too much of an advantage here so in the game, um, black played knight a5, hit the bishop. Again, a3 was such a brilliant move. We play bishop a2. And after knight h5, we have another sacrifice. And I would also like to give you an exercise here. So why to play and uh, do another sacrifice. So, a lot of you are right, it's the move that is rook g6, with the idea that uh, they cannot take, because queen g6, queen h7 is made, because the, the, the white's bishop is uh, pinning the f7 pawn. And so queen h7 will follow, and uh, there is nothing that black can do to uh, avoid the mate in this game. So, rook g6, black played knight g7 and rook f6 with a huge advantage for white black just resigned i'm pretty sure that there is mate on the next moves black is uh, um, down in material and uh, look at the white's pieces right there is nothing they can do all right so now i'd like to show you another very interesting game if we're also going to see how um, an advantage in the opening where white has the center and tries to fight for the center can lead to a very very strong initiative and a kingside attack so here we're gonna see a game um let me make sure i get the names right it's reshevsky versus averbach two classical players two legends uh two stars so we have d4 knight f6 c4 by white controlling the center e6 so the so-called uh, Nimzovich opening if white goes for with knight c3 and black pins uh, the knight with the bishop so what's the idea of um, of this move perhaps uh, the idea is not only to double the pawns for example if after a3 uh, black seems to be giving up their good bishop and white has two bishops but one of the things that black gets is that white has a double pawns c4 could be a target that we could potentially attack maybe if everything goes well and very slow a way of attacking that would be something like bishop a6 knight c6 knight a5 and maybe even queen c8 queen b7 queen c6 again far from reality but it is a target that black would attack and also black gets the so-called light square so you could imagine that after uh, b6 and bishop b7 all this diagonal is to himself and if black manages to control the e4 square well and not allow white e4 um, those squares in the center the e4 square will suffer and usually if white plays anything related to f3 uh, black responds with d5 to take control over e4 so that's the the most fundamental part be behind this fight for the center with this setup as black white goes for the classical line and if white doesn't play e3 black usually doesn't take because uh they're waiting for us to waste a tempo on that and we're not uh, so castles and now we play 92 or not should i say not us but reshevsky played 92 and the idea is simple uh, we want to play a3 and after bishop takes c3 now there is a uh, uh, no one stopping us from taking with the knight and then bishop takes c3 it doesn't make any sense at all on the other hand knight could be a little bit misplaced over here and that's a drawback but knight should come to f4 or g3 a bit later in the game so now black thinks okay time for 
to fight for the center let's play d5 uh, let's get e4 c4 under our control or influence as well and now a3 uh, bishop dropped back there is no point in taking here anymore because black doesn't get either the light squares or the doubled pawns for white so we have bishop to e7 and now cd5 pawn takes d5 and ig3 so very interesting uh, situation uh, why would white uh, be going for knight to g3 what's the idea behind it there is a question in the chat thank you for the question how to decide if the bishop is good or bad well uh, the good bishop or the useful bishop is usually the ones that guards our weaknesses those are the squares that cannot be protected by our pawns so or they would protecting them would cause us uh, problems so for white the the weak squares for now at least are c4 e4 because black does control them with the pawns and we don't and so our light square bishop would be the good one for black is the opposite you look at the pawn on d5 so the opposite color of the pawns in the center are the stuck pawns um, that's the bishop that is good so if the pawns on the light squares then the dark square bishop is the good one because uh, the pawns are already controlling the light squares and dark squares are not under cover so that's the the most fundamental way of describing perhaps the, the which bishop is good or or bad so here in this position uh, what black had to do is fight immediately for the center himself and uh, white plays knight g3 and his plan is going to play be playing bishop d3 f3 and now e4 and get that very mobile superiority in the center when we can transition into space advantage and the initiative with a possible even kingside attack so the way um, that black should have played this is with c5 um so if black strikes in the center right now takes and bishop takes um, both players have reasonable control over the center and position seems to be balanced and as we uh, learned from the previous examples the fact that black has an isolated pawn don't bother him in the middle game as he's not behind in development and also because the white's knight is on g3 we know that it won't help to block the d4 square if it was on f3 it could block it more well and so that will make uh, black's life a lot easier to get d4 so for example you could say uh, bishop d3 knight c6 castles and uh, and d4 would follow very very quickly so this position would be something that black uh, would find pretty comfortable i'm sure to play but in the game um, Averbach uh, played bishop to e6 yes that is true if you have pawns in the center and the light squares then the light square bishop is bad and white plays bishop d3 again in the center and all to control this e4 square knight bd7 castle c6 just normal development bishop goes to d2 rook e8 um, queen c2 and seems like black did also everything uh, well white's plan is very clear if you look at it uh, white is just piling up for everything for f3 e4 that's all he wants superior control of the center and the initiative that we're going to develop afterwards and what black what black uh, should be looking for here perhaps again would be to play c5 it's again preferred to fight for that central squares and if d takes c6 would happen then knight takes c5 is even coming with the tempo because you don't want to give up the light square bishop so here again pretty balanced position i believe black should be very comfortable here as well but in the game uh, Averbach does not fight for the center uh, he played a5 so now we have knight to e c to e2 and slowly perhaps we're maneuvering our pieces to the king side um, knight b6 knight to f4 hitting the light square bishop bishop to d7 rook f to e1 bishop f8 black is trying to control uh, the e4 square as well very well uh, to stop uh, him from achieving e4 break f3 e4 and white tries to get superior control there so f3 bishop to c8 so bishop c8 prevents e4 in a way that d4 drops so white is unable to play the e4 pawn break because say we play e4 and after taking the d4 pawn will drop so that's the purpose of bishop c8 opening up the queen on the d file white finishes the development with rook ac1 g6 
perhaps black is looking to activate the bishop a little bit more with fianchettoing it and here the bishop will look more in the center e5 d4 squares knight back to e2, bishop g7, and white is just preparing e4. Now, even a prophylactic move like h3 is nice, so that after we play e4 and change the structure into that, that black wouldn't have dreams of any knight g4 or bishop g4s. So black plays a4, and now what is the move for white? So the question is this, why so much concentration on e4? Because if we allow um, the pawn move to e4, we will achieve a central superiority. We will gain superiority in the center, which we learned in the previous examples, will lead to more effective pieces. And more effective pieces will lead to initiative, which leads to an attack, which leads to winning the game. What about this transitioning? So that's how I like to uh, explain uh, the central control and why would you need to achieve that it's because of the effectivity of the pieces there that lead to winning games and tactics does that make sense ankit please uh, keep the uh, questions coming use me as your coach uh, i will gladly answer them all um, those who have just have just joined i would be uh, thankful to if you put on a like on the video that means what i do uh, here makes sense and uh, that you enjoyed the, the, the stream and the lesson. And yes, many people are saying it's time to play e4. We get the superiority and uh, the central control could even transpose to the space advantage, a topic that another coach will cover uh, uh, in a couple of days. I'm sure that that's going to be another very interesting uh, stream and lesson for you. Uh, and here, a lot of the times when white gets this space advantage with e5, uh, we chase away the black pieces away from that part which is the king side now which means we get even more uh, squares uh, that are effective for our pieces and that leads to an attack again so uh, here black decided to take and at least black in this position has hopes to attack the the, the white center so there are positions where white has the center and for example grunfeld is one of the openings and black is completely fine so if black find, found himself to be able to attack the center very very well or imagine after bishop e6 that we would play something like e5 seems like space advantage right bad bad idea now we can play knight f to d7 as black we gave up the d5 square c5 will undermine the white center and now once our pawns are gonna be uh, well away from each other because after c5 black is threatening to take on d4 it's going to be very very hard for white to hold on to these pawns just look at the pressure that uh, black will be be building so say we get c5 imagine here on on e5 two pieces immediately the rook could be open d4 is also going to be undermined so that would be a mistake and uh, I don't think that that's a, a good move to make. So don't over push. But as long as the pawns are controlling these squares like they are right now, right? Um, black's pieces cannot go to effective squares. We always have potential to move forward if that is feasible and that is good for us. And all of our pieces could be around with on the most effective squares. Now we can use say, the, 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 the F file, for example and you will see how white pieces will get the superiority so first they play bishop e3 by the way that's what i say uh, black wants to take on e4 because bishop e6 e5 where is black's counterplay now it's a lot harder to undermine uh, those pawns because or at least attack them because the d file is closed of course the plan perhaps with c5 still exists but i believe with the open file it's much better and uh, i understand why our bach decided to take So how do you understand when you have an initiative? Initiative is creating threats. So the initiative is when I can move my pieces to active squares or just make them active while uh, creating threats or just an attack. That's why I call an initiative. So if I move to good squares and my opponent has to react by defending or putting pieces to passive squares, um, that is um, that is initiative. And can you explain the, the central control over the isolated pawn. So if you look back in the video, this video will be able uh, 
available on youtube and you can go back i explained it very well early on maybe like after 15 minutes in the game but i could just mention that from isolated pawn we're controlling the squares in the opponent's position and if you notice our bishop rook and knight as i mentioned a lot of times have uh, bishop has the open diagonal compared to the black's bishop white has an open file and white also has uh, if it's white spawn on d4 e5 c5 outpost for the knight so that stands for your uh, question very shortly but you will find a comprehensive answer earlier in the game in the video around 20 30 minutes back i believe uh, thanks for the question guys so bishop to e3 white is just guarding uh, the d4 square here um, because black is well in indirectly applying pressure on it as you can see uh, so bishop to b3 queen to d2 and black white can in the future exchange the most loyal guard of the black's king side as the dark squares are weakened knight f to d7 and now bishop to g5 so a very very provocative move um, and it's very hard to say what to do here with black so if bishop f6 uh, i don't know if we want to exchange that uh, that's the most loyal guard of our king and who is going to cover the, the dark squares around it queen is not exactly perhaps the most ideal squares ideal piece to, to guard those dark squares is better than nothing of course and i believe that that's the way to play as well uh, but in the game black played f6 and um, i'm not the biggest fan of this move and uh, the point of bishop g5 was this particular provocation after f6 pawn moved it's not necessarily to make the dark square bishop of opponents passive but to just make the pawns around the king move and as they move they're leaving uh, weaknesses behind it so if you look at the pawn structure right as it is now uh, the g6 pawn lost some protection and after we move say h4 h5 take take that's that pawn is already hanging if we do it before imagine we play h4 h5 takes black would be taking with f or h pawn and the only way you can break that is if you say sack so that's a lot more solid so after bishop to g5 black plays f6 white goes back bishop e3 and he's happy with this uh, provocation so now black played knight f8 uh, a bit passive uh, but remaneuvering uh, the knight to very efficient e6 square where again black is hoping to put pressure on the white center and that's the idea that's why black is not like dead loss or complete loss it's a very mobile center for white one of the many centers that are, are described in the in the chess literature uh, but uh, black has counterplay as long as we can put pressure on those pawns or if say somehow th these pawns get stuck so if we say play e5 like imagine this kind of structure and black has huge control over these squares with potential break of c5 and they're well blockaded that's where things could go potentially wrong for uh, white as well so here white just goes for this plan of h4 it's possible of course uh, to play h5 but it's always suspicious to see how the how we move our king side pawns with uh, a vulnerable king as white pieces are clearly aiming at, at that and I don't think we should be touching all the pawns with black so maybe that's the reason why black plays bishop f7 seems to be stopping h5 or at least they, they thought so why plays h5 anyway so the point is that after g takes h5 we just have a, a deadly king side attack knight f5 followed by bishop h6 and all of white's pieces are coming near the king you could imagine queen could come later to h6 after uh, the dark square bishop of whites is exchanged rook f1 the next knight is coming and that's not what black wanted to be in so in the game they just played knight e6 um, again putting pressure on the white center white plays rook f1 to cover the, the file and we're slowly transitioning from that superior central control which leads to superior pieces to a flank attack once we have solved problems in the center and we're superior there uh, we can attack on the side because as you know you are as you're attacking uh, you as one of your opponents is controlling uh, uh the center it's uh, very rare that uh, the attack on the flank will work in fact one of the most common rules that we teach as chess coaches is that when one player is attacking on the king side uh, the counter attack is in the center because right from the uh opening stage we try to make all of our pieces uh, 
to go there and as we if we obtain the control over that center that means effective uh, pieces and that means better counterplay than on the wing but if we already achieve uh, central superiority we should maybe follow that up with a flank attack so why just place rook f2 knight uh, d7 lots of maneuvering rook c f1 and just preparing a kingside attack and now at last black plays c5 we said that he should be playing that on move 10 or 15 right uh, now white plays d5 gets a pass pawn and again as i said like if well blockaded in some scenarios it could be fine but now <laughs> i don't think they're well blockaded and uh, white has the superior center and white is just enjoying himself on the king side so rook to f4 um now white has such a huge compensation uh, white has such a huge compensation for uh, lacking the control of the e5 square that uh, it's just not enough for black to say that hey i have the knight on e5 and uh, i'm going to be enough uh, f to to say that the f file and the central control of whites and the pieces that are coming to the king side are not enough uh, rook f4 and now rook to h4 with a deadly kingside attack and y just uh, closes his eyes about the e5 square it, it, it doesn't matter just one element compared to this gigantic amount of advantage that white has from the peace activity center and the coordination of the pieces and the uh, vulnerability of the black's king perhaps so black of course tries something b5 rook h4 knight e5 and here was the time where Reshevsky played a slow move we had to play bishop h6 and follow that up with a very active move Reshevsky, i think he was low on time at least that's what the what the history says and he played king h1 and here black had an opportunity to create counterplay so believe it or not uh in this position black can survive uh we can play knight takes d3 exchange the the bishop of white and play f5 striking in the center with the tempo so now h4 rook is hanging and after as we move now it's already getting very complicated right so black can even go for knight takes d5 sacrifice well it looks like a sacrifice right and after e takes d5 uh look at uh, the white's counter attack right already black seems to be having compensation and perhaps even developing the initiative and I'm sorry queen takes d5 bishop takes d5 and here black seems to be down a piece but white's king side attack falls apart because queens are exchanged and here already we have an interesting end game that uh black maybe uh could survive at least i i don't know who who to even choose maybe would even choose black at the same time we can see that also there is an attack against uh, the bishop so small initiative here and there but in the game uh white played queen to d7 and that was uh perhaps enough for white to be developing all the all that he wanted and we have rook takes f6 here and the point is this that uh, if you don't find yourself in counter-attacking the, the black white center in time here is black and you're not able to not allow the white pieces to go to the uh, king side then uh, you're just waiting for the white to come and, and get you. So this is a beautiful example how white superiority of the center after f3 and e4 transitioned into space advantage when we put the pawns to restrict the opponent's pieces in his camp and the pieces that are very active behind it. Two very nice initiatives. So imagine rook could be lifted, a f6, h4. Uh, we had the f file. The bishop is always looking to get to h6. And even that pawn, uh, the bishop on d3, actually plays a major role of guarding e4. And if at any moment we could play uh, uh, e5, although that seems to be impossible, bishop would be start to playing again. So we have knight g4, and now just bishop g5 with a dead attack. So after knight f6, there is no chance of surviving that. You could imagine that bishop, uh, bishop g7, desperate try to attack, would just lead to dead dark squares along this diagonal, right? It just not the way to play so in the game black played bishop g7 and now rook f4 followed knight e5 and white is just enjoying himself slowly exchanging the main defenders of the black's king and bringing more and more and more pieces to the king side 
So bishop f6, rook f6. And if I just were to look at this position and I would see some of my students were playing that, my evaluation is that my student, if he was white, is completely winning the game. Black's king is just weak. That's the most important king element in chess. Although white's king is also open, but just look at the white pieces around white, black's pieces around white's king and white's keys, uh, pieces around uh, the black's king. There is a huge difference. So now we had king g7 and uh, all the pieces are coming and knight f5 again due to the pin we can do this move and queen has to be given up and uh, black lost the game. So So this is uh the most perhaps fundamental uh, lesson on the center of course to cover it all uh we would need the uh, more lessons but uh, i believe that i explained well why do we need the pawns in the center and in general control of the center if you're able to control the center with the pieces and your pieces are not chased away that is fine we learned that there are openings where we could apply the pressure on the opponent center and have a huge compensation for that and we also saw a couple of games how the isolated pawn can lead to uh, more central control which leads to better pieces and uh, that leads to initiative and a deadly attack and in this game again i think we saw how uh, white got superior central control that led to uh, a beautiful kingside attack so dear audience uh, i hope you enjoyed the lesson a lot um, thank you all for watching if you can put a like on this video uh, that means a lot to me uh, i'm going to see you again in in the future lessons uh, more and more time uh, looking forward to seeing uh, other coach lesson on the space that is going to be a very good transitioning lessons from today's topic so i'm looking myself forward to that i'm going to be perhaps one of the spectators in the audience thank you all for watching and uh, see you next time uh, be safe have a nice day love the game and continue playing chess